Hello, we're going to look at what we call data level protection methods now. And to be honest, the definitions do vary a little bit. There are different models of security measures. But really, we're looking at how we are able to make things harder for an attacker to gain access to data on a computer. And this concept about having levels is really where, like I say, models can differ, different ways of thinking about security. We can often think of security being like an onion with different layers and you might think the outer layers things like our perimeter security things like physical security often we looked at those in previous videos then maybe look at network security things like firewalls and so on then host security on individual computers maybe in terms of actual security of applications so your programs on your computer then within the small the layer right in the middle we have our data and often data is our most valuable asset because so, much, so many businesses rely on data being used and processed and sold and so on. And also, new legislation means big fines can be imposed if data is not being stored securely. And so that inner layer is so, so important for companies to protect. For this and the next few videos, we're looking at different methods which apply at this so-called data level. Not worth thinking about the levels so much because, like I say, there are some differences in opinion. But we're looking at device hardening. And device hardening is just this general method you go through in order to combine different security measures to try and add as many layers as possible to go through and layers here I mean having different obstacles different hurdles for an attacker to jump through in order to gain access to that data so really you can imagine the attacker starting at that perimeter trying to break through the perimeter trying to get the network breaking through this breaking through the host and so on until eventually they get access to the data a bit like how a castle has got not just one security measure it's got loads it's got layers it's what we call defense in depth. So we've got an outer wall, we've got a big lawn here, we've got a moat, so a little river around the castle, we've got massive castle walls, we've got an inner wall, we've got lookouts and archers roaming about. All different security measures to stop people attacking the castle. Same idea with cybersecurity, except we're trying to have many different security measures all being used together, all to make things harder for an attacker. And there are lots of different techniques we can use to make our device is harder to access, to do device hardening as we call it. And I'm going to go through a few which are applicable to this course and we'll look at two more in the next videos. Um, but for now, let's go through some common ones. So antivirus software is something you'll be aware of, what it is, but in terms of what it does, it's got a very specific definition, a very short definition. So what antivirus software does is scan for malware and removes it if it is found. So really it's detecting malware and removing it if it is detected. So. It's called antivirus software. As we know, there are different types of malware. A virus is just one type. Antivirus software is not going to ignore a worm or ignore a trojan. It's scanning for all malware. It's just the virus is our most well-known one, which is why we call it antivirus software. Another really important thing to be doing, and what is often a technique which is used, is setting your software updates to be auto-installed. So it's a good idea generally to update your software whenever it's available, but that can be hard to do it can be you might forget or you might miss it so having an auto installer can be really valuable so as soon as it is downloaded it just does it overnight maybe straight away because updates to software where you get a software update may include what we call a patch and a patch is a fix for some known vulnerability so the developer of the software has found there is some weakness in their software maybe a backdoor can be created maybe there is some bug which means a security feature doesn't work anymore and a patch be some code which fixes it but you must download and install that patch for that vulnerability to be fixed of course if you're not updating which lots of people don't you are never you're never gonna um, fix that weakness unless you download and install the patch and look installing updates is really important for all types of software so your operating system is a big one and also just general applications but it's especially important for antivirus software because antivirus software works by maintaining a database of all malware the company knows about. It's really important you are downloading updates because those updates will include updates to the database. So new malware is developed every single day. There are new, slightly different ways of approaching malware. There'll be one of our types we looked at, likely, but they are working in slightly different ways because patches are making them not work anymore. Malware developers have to innovate. And so if you are not installing downloads to antivirus software, how is it meant to know about the latest malware? Well, it's not. So it's really important they're kept updated because it won't be able to find the latest malware. A uh, simpler technique we can say is just blocking USB ports. This is because 
as we looked at, it's a threat that people can walk in, plug in a external hard drive, download loads of data, take it out, or the other way around, bring maybe malware into your into your network, into your systems by a USB port. So you can block it either physically or through software, but you can stop people using USB ports. Another couple of techniques which I'm going to mention now, but we're going to look at more in future videos are encryption and firewalls, both good technical measures we can embed. More of a policy measure is where we can limit user access. We've looked at this before, how we can use two-factor authentication, biometrics to reduce access, but also having different permissions. Another common policy is to make sure you are disabling old accounts. So routinely you are scanning for accounts which aren't used anymore. Maybe people leave your company, maybe you're, you are a school and at the end of year 13, everyone leaves and so you can delete their accounts. That's important so that people who are not are no longer have a reason for accessing anything can't just log in with their old account and gain access. And there are other similar policies, procedures, which we will look at in future videos. For example, pertinent to data, we have backup policies. How are you back up, backing up? How often? Where are you going to back up to? And also, there's no plan for your backup if you can't recover it, if something goes wrong. So how would you go about recovering? Uh, we'll look at this in more detail in future videos. And finally, another technique which is really important to be able to harden devices, especially protecting data, is when you are designing software, and designing interfaces, really important you're doing it with a very defensive mentality. In practice this means you need to be incredibly paranoid and very pessimistic really and just assume every user of your system is malicious and is out to get you or at least they are surrounded by malicious people. So you're being really really cautious to protect your data. So let me give you a couple of examples. It is important that as a designer you are considering security too, it's not just the technical people behind the scenes with databases, also front-end designers too. So one way which you would have definitely have come across is where data entry is obscured. So anytime sensitive data is entered into a form, for example, a really common and important design feature is obscuring it. So this is usually done with asterisks, asteri, I don't know what the plural is. We have different symbols replacing your password, for example. And the reason for this is not really because it's not really the company that cares, it's about stopping you falling victim to things like shouldering, where somebody stood behind you looking over your shoulder and can see your password. Whereas this technique is more about protecting the company, quite honestly. So autocomplete, you would have come across two where you start typing something in and you get, it kind of predicts what your ending's gonna be. What is an occasionally, a mis occasionally hear about this being a mistake where a company will use autocomplete on a public form. So here, for example, a username field in a form, you might type in A, and it might show you all of the people starting with A. Or you type in nothing, as is in the case here, and it shows you all of the accounts in that database. Now, if it's a public form, that could be millions of customers you are able to see their names or their usernames, and that makes it much easier for an attacker to target people and guess passwords and so on. If it was an in, if it was a private form, if it was within a company, that's not so bad. You might know every other employee, but a public form definitely also completely should not be used because it gives the attacker loads more information than would be wanted. It's also a massive invasion of privacy for customers. And a third feature which is more defensive is by using what you might call or what you might see called stay logged in messages which really is where you get a message something, saying something like your session will expire, lo uh, click to avoid getting logged out, or click continue if you'd like to stay logged in, etc, etc. The point of this is the company or the website, whatever it is, will log you out automatically unless you show you are available. And why is this? Well, it's to avoid people being able to you know, leave a computer unattended, maybe they're in a public space, they go somewhere else, an attacker could come in and use their computer without them realizing these reduce that risk because they'll log you out unless you are actively using the software or using the website. 